Hello, I'm Tim Stevenson. I'm the Director of Assurance at the SKA. Uh, being the Director of Assurance at the SKA is sort of mostly weeks and weeks of boredom, but a few moments of sheer terror. Just to give you an example of that, I've just seen his expenses claim. And uh, that was just one of those things. Uh, we are a bit of short of time. So what I need to do is to introduce uh, our panel. On the screen right now is Patricia Cooper, who is uh, an analyst, uh, a, a, a consultant to the, I and, uh, the um, industry and technology hub of the CPS, of which I am one of the co-leads. Um, Patricia is uh, very, very experienced, and I'll give the intro now um, for her. Um, she's on the advisory board of the CPS, She's, a, as I say, an advisor to the INT Hub. She founded Constellation Advisory, which is her current outfit, to provide strategic uh, uh, advice to all the players in the, in the Constellation business. But previous to that, she was six years um, leading government affairs, regulatory and policy affairs at SpaceX, achieving some of the early achievements in terms of getting SpaceX recognized and licensed in a number of countries. Prior to that, she was president of the Satellite Industries Association and prior for seven years. And prior to that, she's worked for Intelsat, Pan Amsat, the FCC, the US Department of Commerce, International Trade Administration. So we're talking about a very, very broad experience, extremely valuable to have uh, uh, as an input to the CPS. My other panel member is David Goldstein from SpaceX. Uh, otherwise known as Goldie, who may appear on the screen if we can engineer it. We all try to do it. Uh, Goldie is a 27-year um, United States Air Force uh, veteran in a variety of engineering positions, program management, uh, and in fact teaching within the USAF, but uh, it, it is now um, a space sustainability ambassador, or indeed the space sustainability ambassador for SpaceX as a principal engineer, and he deals with uh, government and non-governmental players, hence the liaison working with us. And indeed, there he is. Um, so I'll give a brief introduction uh, as time is short. I'm famous for not being brief, but I think I need to set the scene for the uh, INT hub. And what we're here to do is to explain why the INT hub exists and what it does and what it will shortly be doing. Now, I need to go into a little bit of history and I won't go in, in enormous detail, but I think it's worthy of some explanation of the engineering that goes into these space systems. The received wisdom, uh, the practice as of sort of 40 years of the 70 years of designing these systems, there have been major assumptions which have now been proved to be under threat. Now, the, the five major assumptions are as follows. Firstly, that if you build such a system, even if there's a few of them in your small constellation, there will be no environmental impact beyond the vague understanding that at some point there needs to be space traffic management to avoid collisions, and that the deployment of these systems in the past has created space debris. In the historical past, it was optics covers, clamp bands from launchers, launcher up and stages, and all that kind of stuff. We're, we're beyond that now, but nevertheless, that original awareness was creeping in in the 1980s and 1990s that you needed to minimize space debris. And of course, the environmental issue of re-entry, uh, not only solid objects hitting the ground, but also the fact that you're depositing all sorts of uh, mineral and, and uh, metallic species into the upper, upper, upper atmosphere. So the original assumptions were naive. They were limited. The environmental impact assumptions were limited to that. The second point was that you could design Earth-facing surfaces in any way you liked. And one of the things that you needed to do was to make sure that those surfaces and in the interior of the spacecraft didn't get out of thermal control. So that if you, those of you are old enough to remember what a space shuttle looked like with its payload bay doors open, 
the view of that uh, of the space shuttle, particularly when it was Earth pointing, was white. It was the thermal treatment was beta cloth, which is a, a PTFE or Teflon impregnated a glass fiber cloth, and that was used everywhere. And indeed, it's the outer shell of of astronaut suits and so on. So it's white, and it's therefore reflective. But the other choices for smaller space platforms are second surface mirrors, which are reflective. And in fact, they're specular if you keep them flat. And they're and the ubiquitous white paint, AZ, as it's known in the trade. So the original assumption was you could use a mixture of those things on all of the surfaces of your spacecraft, including the Earth facing surface. So the natural inclination was to, to design and build something that was reflective. The third assumption was that you could, your, the attitude control of your spacecraft was entirely your business. You did something that was driven entirely by mission requirements. If you had a non-articulating solar array, you pointed it towards the sun to charge the batteries. If you had an Earth-facing payload, obviously one face of your spacecraft needed to be facing the Earth. And so, and the, obviously thermal control was another issue which drove the orientation of the spacecraft. And that would only vary during mission phase. So during the, the, the boost phase to the final orbit, uh, you, you would be probably concentrating mostly on charging batteries. So that would drive your attitude control and you wouldn't care about how bright the spacecraft appeared during that phase. That assumption is obviously also under threat. Now, some of those issues with attitude control, meaning where do you point the radiators? Where do you point the solar arrays during that phase? I've got a little bit easier because in the last 20 years, electronics in spacecraft have become much lower power. Therefore, you need smaller radiators. You need smaller solar arrays. But that doesn't help too much. The fourth assumption is a very simple one and still persists with some of these operators and manufacturers is that radio astronomy is protected, full stop. The fifth assumption is that EMI, uh, electromagnetic compatibility for any given spacecraft is a simple matter of making sure you don't screw up your own spacecraft operations. You don't screw up any spacecraft that are launched on the same adapter as you and you don't screw up the operations of your launcher. That was the only consideration. And now, most definitely, with these ground-based observations of the internal electronics of spacecraft, that assumption is now being threatened because the electromagnetic compatibility of spacecraft now extends beyond just the launcher and adjacent payloads, but also to ground-based radio astronomy. So the wide spectral signature of these space systems is now becoming important and those things are having some influence on what we see from the ground both optical infrared longer wavelengths and it, the in the radio spectrum so the growing awareness that these assumptions are actually wrong that growing awareness has been driven by you the community with the, your leadership and previous meetings that awareness within industry is growing, and there have been strong reactions from some elements of industry, and those strong reactions are a combination of a collaborative spirit between what you have said you can see and the problems that what you can see create for you and industry doing what they can uh, indeed to ameliorate those effects. So the INT hub is meant to build upon that historical legacy, if I might exaggerate and use that word, uh, what has been built upon in terms of mutual understanding between the community and industry, to keep industry in the loop, to keep to draw industry more and more into understanding the nuances of the problem that, that constellations create. And moreover, where industry has come up with solutions to perform to form a platform that allows industry to share. And that indeed is already happening. And Dave uh, and Goldie will actually tell us a little about a bit what SpaceX have done in that domain. So the function of the INT hub is to draw industry ever more inwards and ever more together with the community to, to 
jointly solve the problem. So it's not just about industry bringing in new technology. It's also about increasing the understanding on both sides of where the two sides come from, but also also to, to, to help within the CPS to coordinate calibrated observations of uh, prototype systems that are being launched all the time so that the industry partners, the operators and the manufacturers can tell just how good their measures uh, how, how, what they've been achieve, have, have achieved. So the INT hub um, has existed for a while. We've had um, uh, one um, town hall. Uh, it it, it uh, continuously works to draw in industry and uh, Patricia will tell us about where we are with that uh, and how things in fact are going. Uh, and I will defer now to uh, Goldie, um, uh, who can, I hope, share his slides and give his presentation. Okay, I'm going to try to share my screen. Okay, is that working? It's good. Are, are you seeing my? We are holding. Okay, great. Um, well, I changed the name of this uh, this morning because I thought it would be funny to talk about reflections on uh, my reflections on satellite reflections. Um, but it's always difficult when you're giving a presentation like this because you can't get any feedback from the audience. Uh, and so I'm hoping that at least you chuckled or laughed uh, at my reflections on reflections. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to just chat a little bit about about Starlink. Uh, probably some of these slides um, some of you may have seen um, previously, but, um, but but here we go. So, uh, you know, Starlink is making a difference around the world. And I, and I think um, if you, if you if you don't take anything else away from this uh, this presentation, I hope that you'll um, that you'll reflect a little bit on the difference that this constellation is making around the world. Um, I did not get a chance to put in a a, a little um, a, a little photo from from Maui, but I was at the Amos conference a couple of weeks ago on on, on Maui, and um, at least ten people came up and thanked us for the terminals that were um, that were sent over um, one one woman said they, they had no phones for um, for a week and uh, and their neighbor got a starling terminal and and they were able to communicate and they they hadn't had that capability and those kinds of things are very um, are very refreshing um, I didn't get a chance to up, update this slide but we have over 5,000 we've launched over um, 5,000 satellites now and you know, we we are deeply, deeply committed to protecting both human space flight and making sure that the the space is safe and sustainable and accessible. And, and along with that, um, to 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 do our part in in keeping the the skies as dark as possible and uh, and quiet. And so the in terms of the development with over five thousand satellites launched, we have over two million customers now. Um, delivering high-speed internet um, anywhere in the world with our with our optical links. Now um, we don't need the gateways on the ground to be able to communicate, and so so we have a mesh network of satellites all around the globe where we can provide service to the re most remote um, spots on the Earth. Um, as long as you have power and Starlink terminal, you can uh, you can get the service. Um, I, I did want to make sure that everybody understood uh, how many satellites we filed for and how many have been approved. And so we have two different um, generations of systems that we filed for, our Gen 1 system and our Gen 2 system. Uh, the Gen 1 system was for 4,408 satellites in, um, in low Earth orbit, basically from 530 kilometers up to 570 kilometers in altitude, a couple of different shells. And then our Gen 2 system, which our application was for 30,000 satellites, 
uh, in that license and 7,500 had been approved. Um, there's another 22,500 that have not been approved as part of our Gen 2 license. Um, so that, that that is the extent of of our um, of our of our filings with the with the FCC within the U.S. So uh, so as as we talk about the reflections, I'm sure many of you have seen this slide before. But um, fundamentally, for for Starlink, the way that we operate is with our the chassis um, of our um, satellite bus is is basically tangential to the surface of the earth and so the incident light that comes in um, that can reflect off of the uh, off of the chassis uh, in a specular way can be can be seen um, by by that sort of pie of of folks um, that are um, that are just near the terminator uh, and then uh, you know as a satellite um, as a satellite as a satellite moves you can you can get the solar array reflecting, and so, so we have um, we have targeted mitigations um, to to do to do the best we can to get down below, um, uh, I guess above a visual magnitude of seven. And uh, just as a reminder, visual magnitude seven equivalent is about an eight U cubesat that is at um, five hundred and fifty kilometers. Um, that's pure white. And so, you know, a, a large shoebox basically at 550 kilometers, it's pure white, um, gives you about a visual magnitude seven. And so this is, this is quite challenging for, um, for satellites that are, that, are much, that are much larger than that. So, so we focused our, our mitigations uh, in, a, in a couple of different areas. In terms of the hardware and satellite design, um, because of our unique, um, the unique, aspect of the way that we operate and the shape of our satellites, uh, making the, the surface that is facing the earth and, and tangential to the surface of the earth, making that surface more reflective uh, reduces, the, uh, reduces the impact to observers on the ground. Uh, so these um, specular materials um, that, that we talk about, this dielectric frag mirror film that we use um, that you can see very clearly in um, in some of the the images and videos that we that we post from our launches, uh, the 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 Bragg mirror film uh, goes it it because it because it's dielectric it um, it can lay over the the phaser antennas and 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 completely completely cover the nadir facing deck of the satellite so that. Oh, yeah. uh, Yes. Only my eagle-eyed colleague has noted the battery on your laptop is running down very rapidly. Okay. Um, yeah, I have, it, I have it plugged in, but uh, but but we'll, but we'll uh, I'll yeah I'll do the best I can. Um, okay. So uh, so um, yeah we uh, yeah we can launch satellite, thousands of satellites, but we can't keep our uh, our iPads charged at <laughs> SpaceX. Um, so, so let's see, um, we also use um, very dark materials on those surfaces that, um, that, are, not, um, that are not tangential to the earth. And so, um, so we have um, we've worked on a very dark um, black paint. Um, we also pigment our solar rays um, to make sure that they are, um, they are darker. And, and, then, and then we've also um, basically, oversized our solar arrays so that we can off point them to reduce the reflections. And so we have, um, we have, we have larger than needed solar arrays so we can off point. And, and then our, you know, our, uh, our thermal design is also quite um, uh, robust because we, for our, our second generation satellites, we're able to account for the, um, the change in thermal load um, with the black, with the black paint. Um, during the design, as opposed to our first generation satellites, which we weren't able to do that. Uh, we also, with, it, with respect to the satellite operations, um, we work very hard on uh, operating our satellites in a way to minimize the reflections. And, um, and, and I'll talk about this uh, on the next slide as well, but you know, when, we get, when we get measurements back, uh, what we do basically is we look at the outliers 
and, and those bright um, bright spots um, or bright uh, the bright um, uh, configurations. And then we go back and we tweak our operations to try to remove those edge cases. And so, um, so we're happy to to get and receive any um, and any any measurements that that people take in it. And if you have measurements and you're like, you know, they say they're around visual dimension seven, but we're seeing we're seeing um, reflect we're seeing observations down in the threes and fours or fives. Um, please please give us those satellites and the times, um, and then we can go back in and look at what the attitude of the satellite was, so we can um, try to try to discern what's going on with those edge cases and and and, re and reduce them, and, and we do that all the time. Um, so uh, so we also have autonomous adjustments that as we approach the Terminator, we all point the array, um, we bias the bus so that um, the likelihood of the reflection is reduced, and we continue to um, evolve those um, CONOP uh, to, to reduce, reduce brightness. And I think you're seeing the positive effects of that in, you know, we built um, a much larger uh, V2 mini satellite uh, and yet the reflections are, um, are dimmer than, than our 1.5s. Uh, and then in terms of satellite predictions, we're continuing to, to, uh, to, to work on our, our predictions. We're working on better drag modeling. Um, uh, making sure that our maneuvers are are baked in very accurately, and and so we publish uh, accurate ephemeris predictions on Space Track, and I think I've mentioned this uh, many times, but if if you want the very best predictions, anyone with a Space Track account can go out on on Space Track, and you can um, download our uh, the ephemerities for all of our satellites three times a day. We publish those, and in the near future, we'll have a SpaceX website where you'll be able to use an API and not even have a login and just be able to go and get our, um, our predictions. And, and those may even be at a higher frequency than, than three times a day. And, and so with respect to the best practices that we, we, um, we, we sort of documented is, uh, you know, the first thing is, is taking uh, the, these reflection and the mitigations very seriously. And, and we have done that um, ever, ever since we first were um, you know, uh, first launched that the first set of of um, our V zero point nines and started getting feedback. Um, we 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 build we we have criteria for our build that that brightness mitigation is in the design criteria, and so you build, you measure, you model, you launch and operate, and then you have a feedback loop where after you measure, um, you can make you can make changes. And so the the approaches that we've taken basically are are um, re, you know reflecting that light away. You, you can darken your surfaces. You can shade so that um, the reflections uh, go off in a in a in, in a better direction. Or you can avoid um, avoid having the reflections are, are basically the sort of four areas. Um, continuously seeking to understand those edge cases. I talked about that a little bit. Of, of getting feedback and looking at, you know, when when the satellite is bright and what can we do about that, and and we take that feedback very seriously, and uh, and and I wish that our satellites could be transparent so the light would just go through them and you wouldn't uh, you, you wouldn't have any reflections, but um, we try to be as transparent as possible and communicate and share the things that we've learned and and what we're doing and you know we're we're making the dielectric mirror film and our black paint available at our cost to anyone who um who would want to use it and so um so yeah you know the in the big picture we are taking it very seriously and we hope that um we hope that y'all feel that we're being we're being transparent with what we're doing uh starlink makes a huge difference across the world you know we're, we're launching a lot of satellites but but we are we work tirelessly to keep space safe, sustainable, and, and accessible to others, and uh, through you know through coordination and through um, through the the um, the CPS and 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 other forums, you know we're we're doing our best to coordinate with astronomers and make sure that we're getting feedback and understanding things that we can do and mitigations that we can make. Um, but but we also you know, want to encourage there to be development on the on the ground side of figuring out ways to avoid 
uh, avoid imaging when satellites are in view and also to be able to post-process um, the potentially post-process some of those um, uh, when, when you when you see bright satellites to be able to post-process those out of your imagery. Um, we welcome collaboration with other operators. You know, as I said, we're making our products available and um, you know, we we have um, we have an agreement with the NSF and uh, and we'll be providing them a report um, by the end of the year on the, the work that we've we done on on reflection mitigation, uh, you know, both on the on the uh, optical side and on the uh, radio astronomy side. And so um, so working with the NSF has been great. They have been um, amazing partners with us in, in all this and helping us learn and keep accountable. And uh, the model that we have with them, we think is 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 something that um, you know all satellite owner operators could could and should do. So with that, um, I will um, I will stop. And I don't know if we're going to do questions now or if we're going to wait and do questions later. And I'll try to get another charger for my iPad. Are you? Uh, do you need to leave very shortly? Uh, no, I'm I'm good until um, I'm actually good in it for another. Uh, another 45 minutes or so. Okay, no, that's great. Well, what we'll do then is we'll go to Patricia and then we'll do the Q&A because that's what the time allocated is for. Let's do it after. Patricia. Thank you so much, Jim. And uh, thanks for letting Goldie start out. I think he's uh, framed the conversation really well. Uh, and I love the reflections on reflections. Uh, I've been in, involved in this conversation since uh, its very start. And I wanted to kind of just remind folks how far we've come. It's been four and a half years since the May 2019 inaugural launch of, uh, of Starlink. And at that point, uh, the most recent technical article I was told was uh, from 2002, so 20 years earlier almost, about uh, the Iridium Solar Antenna Glints. Uh, the largest proposed constellation at the time was SpaceX at 4,400. Um, there was no target for acceptable brightness when uh, the complaint was that we were too bright. The next question was, what's an acceptable level of brightness? And we didn't really have a good uh, a good way of deciding that. Um, there was very little experience in mitigation techniques. My favorite tweet was paint it black dummy. Um, and I think we've come a long way from that. Um, there was active coordination between astronomy and satellites but only on radio astronomy, on RF interference coordination and, uh, and protection uh, and, and as, as was required by the ITU and, and by some countries. Um, there was no uh, interaction that I was aware of between the uh, ground-based optical uh, astronomy community and the communication satellite community. And I would also say that the space-based tools uh, for space data were um, government run, they were certainly less available, less rich in, in content, and a lot more clunky, a little bit less um, uh, understanding of what kind of detail of space data would be uh, useful to uh, astronomers in understanding this position. Um, and I would say, I mean, they're pretty stovepiped, the satellite and astronomy communities, except for this little intersection um, on radio astronomy interference coordination. So in those intervening years, we've come quite a long way. Um, one, I would say that the uh, awareness has definitely been raised across the space community writ large, um, both satellites and astronomy, but also other stakeholders that hope to make use of space are starting to think about, um, Tim, as you mentioned, not just uh, visibility, but, uh, but the overall um, uh, long-term effects on space, particularly as uh, most countries are starting to develop a space agenda. They have aspirations to have space as part of their economy, part of their workforce, part of their uh, manufacturing, their uh, trade balance. Um, they want to experiment in space. They want to utilize the benefits of, um, of what space-based services can bring. And it, it, as that reliance or hope for space as a component in national policy expands, um, I, I think very useful uh, emphasis on um, studying and understanding better what each space activity um, means in terms of affecting the uh, other satellite uh, and space exploration and space commerce activities that might 
might follow. Um, we, of course, now have a very rich academic and technical inquiry into the impact that um, satellites can have on astronomy. Um, I think notably several are, have been created jointly with industry, the SATCON and Dark and Quiet Skies, the Jason papers, a couple other independent papers that I know, um, SpaceX and the Vera Rubin teams have, have issued. I think that's especially valuable. Um, we've also had, you know, as, as Goldie mentioned, 5,000 Starlink satellites, probably about a total of 6,000, 6,500 satellites have been launched since that first set of Starlink satellites, the bulk are Starlinks, but not all. Um, and I think we've gotten a, at the outset, I think there was a great deal of um, maybe skepticism about the usefulness of, um, of these constellations in comparison to the um, affection and importance that astronomers have for the scientific uh, discoveries that you're, you're trying to make. And I think it, as Goldie mentioned, there's a, a much clearer um, picture of how these low earth orbiting platforms can be used and, uh, and why they're being promoted. Uh, and it's largely because the services that they can deliver are uh, optimized at this low altitude. And I think that understanding is better. It's, it, broadband is faster if it's from a low, if it's 5,000, if it's 550 kilometers versus 32,000. Um, imagery is, uh, is clearer and crisper and can give more information if it's uh, on a lower Earth orbiting satellite. Um, and potentially um, uh, cell phone calls are workable without that voice lag. So there, there are reasons why those satellites are being proposed um, and it's because the applications suit that lower Earth orbiting platform in a way that geostationary is not as well suited. Um, in those intervening four and a half years, by my count, about 500,000 satellites have been proposed um, for all those sorts of applications, broadband, direct to cell, internet of things, um, earth observation, weather, um, all kinds of purposes, uh, 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 transportation manage management, um, all sorts of purposes that are optimized from that low earth orbiting uh, platform. Those 500,000 satellites in total have been filed at the ITU through a, a, a pretty long list of countries, uh, certainly the US, the UK, France, Germany, China, but also Rwanda and Liechtenstein. The most recent one was I think 19,000 satellites from Italy. Uh, the largest is 330,000 satellites from Rwanda. So this is not a, uh, a short list of countries that have a stake in the value of constellations, but also the responsibility of constellations. Um, we also had a great success in setting a brightness target at seventh mag, and I think that is very useful in these conversations. The um, IAU Center has set up, uh, formalized a little bit the voluntary observation networks, which uh, I think is really helpful for kind of a repeat measurement that's got some control elements to it. Um, and of course, some private companies are also offering measurements uh, for satellite companies to understand their impact. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on space database tools, improving those, making them more um, sort of big data and AI driven, uh, being able to ingest data from multiple sources. Um, those are government driven, like the US Commerce Department and the um, European Space Agency. Both have projects underway for space sustainability um, and safety uh, uh, databases. But there are also companies, uh, private companies with radars or databases, uh, Celestrek, Slingshot, Leo Labs, there's a growing number of that as a service um, with richer data sets, more predictive, more available uh, information, which I think can, can really um, be helpful in this inter interaction. Um, and then the, you know, maybe the most notable, and we kind of forget how, how, uh, how recently it was that we had no mitigation tools and no discussion of mitigation tools. Um, thanks largely to the R&D and um, investment of SpaceX, we have multiple mitigation tools um, and approaches that have been tested and measured, the darkening of elements, blocking of reflection, dielectric mirrors, the tilting, using uh, tilting maneuvers uh, and orientation, um, clustering the satellites in their string after they've been launched, um, 
you know, there's there are now best practices that SpaceX pioneered that no one had thought of because we hadn't been thinking, um, neither community had been looking at this problem despite, you know, hundreds of satellites being launched beforehand. So we've come a long way. Um, I, I am glad to be at this um, advisory role for the industry and technology hub, because I can say that one of the things that we've done really, I think I've been very gratified by, is that in raising awareness, we're also finding that um, satellite companies are largely of goodwill. And so if we can give them tools that are accessible and affordable and are um, effective, uh, I believe that they will integrate those. Um, I've had, I think it's great that SpaceX is making their uh, non-reflective paint and the um, and the stickers that have had such good uh, uh, ob ob observed um, effectiveness uh, available to everyone. Um, I'm aware of at least a couple other tools that are being developed that are gonna be made um, available to other satellite companies uh, either at cost or, or just, just for use open source. Um, and and that's that's a great sign of this kind of uh, growing collaborative exchange, really a marketplace of solutions. That what we need to do is is uh, is make that a an ongoing uh, exercise uh, with non-reflective materials, with um, with other techniques that may um, uh, assist to reduce the impact. Um, we're at the in, Industry and Technology Hub aiming to create kind of a, a forum for companies to exchange information and share what would be most helpful. Um, one of the areas I'm concerned about is that we're we, that we that we don't forget that we need to develop um, these tools, these resources, and um, just skip to saying we need regulation. Whereas I think most governments won't employ regulation if there's not an acceptable method to um, to satisfy the requirement. Uh, and so if, if there's no way to get to the outcome, I think those regulations are gonna be hard to, um, to adopt. So um, we'll be looking at things like predictive tools, um, trying to build up uh, a, uh, a source of test uh, on uh, ground, ground based testing. Um, there are no test labs that do this that I'm aware of. Um, and, you know, they certainly aren't, uh, for physical testing, they certainly aren't affordable or accessible. Um, uh, software tools as well with predictive software would be uh, another useful tool. And I know that the um, conference here is looking at other resources, you know, filters, scheduling, software, et cetera, like that. And I think that is the direction we need to go. We do need to remember that it is, it's just been a few years and this is a novel uh, technology area that we really have, have moved forward. Um, there's also going to be ongoing work on space data. The databases that the governments are, 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 um, are developing are coming close to ready. And it's been uh, encouraging that they're taking astronomers' requests of the level of information they need on board. Um, we need to keep talking about, um, uh, about awareness. And we need to keep looking at uh, tools that companies that are aware and have goodwill and want to be good stewards in space um, have access to so that they can actually um, mitigate their impact. And, and that, I think, is going to be one of the most useful outcomes of the IAU CPS's uh, industry and technology. So I'll leave it there. Um, you know, our next steps need to be on predictive tools mitigation tools, uh, ongoing work on space data, and an ongoing work uh, to raise awareness and, uh, and uh, kind of normalize the mitigation and solution set into um, our space technology uh, ecosystem. Thanks. So bearing in mind, we've got around 20 minutes, we'll launch into the Q&A now. Uh, I have a few questions, and we've also got some arriving on Slack. Uh, first one, I think you've actually answered the first one, Patricia, in terms of of why new proposals are still flowing in. But the uh, I think the major question I think for us here, and this is me being kind of optimistic, 
by saying it seems unlikely that all the planned constellation projects will actually deploy. What are yeah. the stumbling blocks or mechanisms by which uh, what we call constellation fever slows down, therefore <laughs> meaning that we don't end up with 500,000 uh, spacecraft in low Earth or mid Earth orbit? Yeah. Uh, so I think the most recent generation of constellation fever came with a, 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 a an intersection of um, great technological advancement with small sats, with um, with access to inexpensive launch, and with um, access to capital. And the uh, all three of those need to be kind of in place to build a constellation. They're very very difficult. And I, I, you know, not just because I work there, but SpaceX has made this look easy. If you look at other other constellation projects and their timelines and their deployments, that may be more um, more in keeping with the, what we should be expecting. SpaceX is uncommonly swift, um, but I would also say um, investment is going to be a big deal. The willingness to put money behind a speculative constellation is going to be critical. And um, I was just looking at a report that the Bryce Tech folks issued uh, in September of this year. Uh, they said $8 billion was invested in 2022, um, a 46% decline from the 15 billion invested in 2021. 2021 was a banner year for space investment. Um, so I think it was sort of a spike in 2021 and now it's back down to a more reasonable, um, you know, more, more uh, familiar levels. So access to capital is going to be good. There is going to be one of the critical areas. The other is, um, you know, this is a high volume manufacturing industry. Um, the largest constellation before Starlink was 300 satellites. And if you go to a manufacturer and say you want to build 8,000, 10,000, 19,000 satellites, that, that's not what they're set up to do. So being able to get capacity and, um, and uh, have a, a manufacturing path for production for production line is a is another gating consideration. And then uh, thirdly, launch. Right now, there's a real crunch in um, uh, in launch vehicles uh, as several players develop their next generation. And Falcon Nine is really the the strongest game uh, flying. So uh, and and SpaceX, to their credit, have launched. Uh, competitor constellations, including OneWeb, they're signed up to to launch Global Star and Teleset, I believe, too. So access to being able to launch is another gating limit. Um, but the real thing is having a business plan with a service that's that's viable, that uh, that uh, investors uh, of any style will uh, see a return on investment from. Yeah, thank you. Okay, the next one's for Goldie. Uh, so you need to put your mind in where SpaceX was a few years ago, because this is really about generic, a generic response. If I was to make independent brightness measurements, not coordinated through through the CPS, so I'm a, uh, you know, a, a freelancer, so to speak, how do you recommend I approach the relevant operators to get the necessary background information regarding such things as phase of flight during my observation, the development status of the spacecraft I've observed, are these things, that kind of information, likely to be made public by operators, or, or should they be? Uh, in, in my opinion, they should be made available. Um, I, you know, the to me, the very the very best approach is the direct approach approach, and that's just to ask, ask them. Um, you know, uh, it, it's it's not difficult typically to find contact information for. Um, for companies, and so um, so you know, people being persistent and reaching out and asking uh, is is always um, is always a, a great approach. You know, for for companies that file uh, in the U.S. with the FCC, are the filings are public, and so there's a lot of information can be learned uh, in those public filing documents. So um, so that's another 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 source um, of truth that you can you can find um, it can be a, it can be a, a a maze of documentation and and changes and uh, and modifications to the to the filings but 
but typically you can um, you can suss out uh, the sort of operational phases from from there because in their debris mitigation plans, typically companies will describe the the conop for where they're injecting, um, when they're going to be doing orbit raising and um, and uh, and deorbit. So, so I think I think some of that can be can can be is discoverable publicly, but um, but the best the best way is just to is just to ask and you know hopefully we're setting a good example for other companies to follow where we're we're being you know as transparent as possible on on all the phases of our of our missions and and then also providing as accurate of predictions of where our satellites are going to be as possible um hopefully that will be a trend that will continue i know i know uh, in talking with folks from um, from OneWeb and from Kuiper because we, you know, we, we talk to them on the uh, uh, coordination on the space safety side. They're, they're both all in on making sure that this data is available to, um, to, to astronomers and to others. Yeah, well, Tim, it occurs to me that, that sorry, Tim, it occurs to me that one, one of the things that we haven't been asking for of regulators, instead of just asking them to make this a requirement of some sort, um, one of the things we haven't asked is for um, this uh, provision of data to be um, first public when filed with their national regulator. Um, the, the FCC, the US FCC is um, noted for its uh, you know, public availability, but there are other governments that have constellations. You can't even find out what date their license was, much less what their um, orbital, orbital debris or orbital safety commitments are or expectations. Um, so that kind of awareness could be a useful um, regulatory advocacy piece, as well as um, expecting that Constellation operators licensed through that country um, have to share their uh, their relevant space data in some platform. Because I don't think that's otherwise required, and the disclosure certainly is um, not a common thing. Yeah, so the regulator... The regulators can uh, uh, create a, an environment in which they expect, in inverted commas, this kind of information to be provided. And the INT hub of the CPS can create a sort of moral environment in which that information uh, should be shared by the operators that are subscribing mm -hmm. to the CPS. Uh, okay, um, I'm just um, watching the time. I think we'll take a question from the floor now. You were first. I already oh. got the mic, sorry. Oh. Okay. Uh, so my name is Benjamin Winkel. Thanks a lot for this uh, interesting discussion. I would have a question to David, if I may. Um, first, uh, let me thank you very much for your efforts to protect astronomy and so on. Um, radio astronomy, you didn't cover that so much in your talk, so I would have a radio astronomy question, uh, which is related to the recently detected uh, leakage by the onboard electronics. And, um, as far as I'm aware, uh, you already uh, implemented some countermeasures, and I wonder if you could comment on this. Do you know more about this? Yeah, I apologize. I um, did not come prepared to talk about anything on the radio astronomy side, but um, if you want to email me, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll provide my email address. You can email me, and I'll um, I'll get the right folks, because um, I, I know that, um, I know that uh, we're working hard on this. And um, yeah, also taking it as seriously as we do the optical side. So you can you can email me. My email is pretty um, easy. It's Goldie G O L D Y um, at spacex.com, uh, and and just um, frame the question there, and I'll um, I'll make sure we get get the answer back to you. And Goldie, if you want to make your uh, response uh, available to broadly, we can use the center to help do that. Sure. Yeah, that, that, that would be great. Thank you, and I apologize for not being prepared to talk to talk about that. Okay, a question from online. Uh, let me see, I think probably for Patricia, but you can fight it out maybe. Uh, Joshua Sokol. Uh, uh, I know who's been that fight. Speaking from experience, <laughs> It's difficult for journalists or the broader public, public to get more information than boilerplate statements about engineering efforts and perspectives from within satellite industry, especially compared to the relative openness of NASA or institutional researchers engaged in work on this topic. How would you recommend journalists 
include current data and expert perspectives from within the satellite industry in the coverage? There's a naughty one for you. That's an interesting question. You know, there is a difference between a project that's paid for with um, public money, with taxpayer money, and a project that is uh, a privately funded project. Their obligations to disclosure are different. Um, and, and there also is a competitive uh, and proprietary kind of aspect to, um, to uh, disclosing lots of information. Um, in any sector, the companies think carefully about how they release news and information. Um, I think there are probably uh, relatively few satellite companies who are gonna talk um, uh, on the record about their plans until they're ready. And that's just a reality. What we're hoping to do is create um, a technical discussion where those plans and approaches can be exchanged maybe under NDA with a specific astronomer or under some uh, confidence with a, a group of astronomers to validate it. And then you can feel like that's a reasonable course of action. Um, uh, it, I think part of that is just the nature of business where you're not disclosing all your plans to the press. That's gotta be a pretty consistent problem for journalists. But the other is this is a, the, this has not been a, um, a, a dialogue without recrimination. So uh, we want to make sure that we keep the dialogue at a constructive, um, you know, solutions-based way so that companies aren't, don't feel deterred from um, leaning forward uh, for fear of uh, some kind of recrimination. Dolly, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, I, I think she, I think she got it. Okay, fair enough. Jessica, who's hiding the microphone? Hi, I'm Jessica Heim. So I'm the um, one of the co-leads of this community engagement hub of CPS. And so I have a question for you. A lot of what we've been talking about today has been you know, a lot of on tools and technologies and that type of thing. And that's obviously extremely important. Um, but I wanted to, you know, bring in some of the perspectives on things that, you know, were expressed on Monday from some of our indigenous speakers, and I was really interested in hearing um, industry perspective on this. So, like, some of the things that were brought up on Monday on, you know, how to have, you know, more productive engagement with indigenous nations, with space industry, and some of the things that were brought up was, you know, wanting to have, you know, more like of these long-term, you know, relationships. How do you co-create something together? And, like, one thing that was specifically brought up was, you know, instead of saying, you know, company saying, well, this is what we're going to do, you know, is this okay? Therefore, you know, now we consulted with you, but like, how can these uh, voices, these nations, these communities be brought in earlier in and to have more of like a co-creative process? And I'm just really interested in your perspective on that, as that's like a lot of what I'm trying to do with the CE Hub is how to facilitate these relationships and have these more co-creative collaborative processes and good communication. So yeah, interested in both of your perspectives. Yeah, I can, I can speak a little bit, you know, from my own experience at the Satellite Industry Association and also at various operators and, and including Starlink. Um, we regularly had conversations with public fora um, as users. I think the satellite industries may be a little bit less um, used to that than say the cellular industry because traditionally satellites have had their services sold sort of as wholesale. They'd sell capacity to a reseller. And so the link to the direct end user um, is, is seen in something like satellite TV or now in satellite broadband, but it's kind of a new thing. Um, whereas most other traditional satellite operators have sold indirectly. And so they wouldn't have had this kind of direct, um, you know, citizen facing aspect. Um, there are ways of, um, uh, you know, having a, a, a sort of town hall kind of meeting uh, if the companies are willing to do it. Uh, I know that, uh, for example, there's a group, uh, the Alaska Federation of Nations, um, in uh, that uh, is very active in trying to bring uh, communications to remote uh, communities all over uh, Alaska, and they held a couple roundtables that we were glad to participate in. And, uh, and and share information about. So I, I don't think 
uh, it's, it's, it's complicated, but I do think it has to be something that can't be, you know, um, it, it, it should be sort of co coordinated in a certain way so that there's a, um, not an endless number of those engagements because you just can't support it. There's, there's just not enough people in the company to do that. So I, I think creating, convening a group and um, having kind of a combination of um, what our concerns are, what uh, is being done and what uh, is the value of the service? How can it, how can it be used in, uh, for native communities? I think that's a really useful way of doing it. And I would think um, there could be some strong interest in participating. Um, I would also say that the um, application process in at the FCC is a public one. Um, and there's a, a bureau at the FCC for um, for native interests. And uh, there's also an opportunity for anyone to, to comment. So there are ways to get your voice heard, but that exchange that you're talking about, Jessica, I think we could um, do as a collaborative. Yeah, I, I echo the... the and agree with Patricia again. Um, you know, in the big picture, we we are we are open to having those dialogues. You know, some of our first Starlink customers were Indigenous peoples, um, and uh, and we still have very strong relationships um, it, with respect to providing the service um, and and improving their ability to get um, to get on the internet. And so, there's a balance, obviously, there. And I think Patricia sort of um, highlighted that a little bit. Uh, but 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 yes, having some forum whereby we could um, we could we could not be meeting with um, all of them into all, all indigenous peoples individually, but having more of a, a focused effort to me would be a healthier way of of doing it and a more sustainable way of of doing it. But we're, we're open to having those dialogues for sure. The two the two um, projects that I thought were especially they were early, but they were also really impactful. Were uh, the Pekanjikum in uh, in Canada and the Ho Tribe in Washington State? I think we talked about trying to get them involved in the conversation on Monday. I don't know um, where that landed. Okay, thanks very much. I think we've got one more uh, time for one more question from online. This is Robert Massey from the RES, who's been waiting quite a long time for an answer to this question, and it's about regulation. So really, I think this is for for Goldie. Um, at least SpaceX is making efforts to control brightness, etc. But would they be comfortable with regulation mandating dark and quiet skies considerations? Again, I'm 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 back to there's there's a balance there, whereby um, we you know we we talk about the best practices which can be aspirational, right? We have, we have goals that are aspirational, whereas on the regulatory side, the regulatory side, in my opinion, needs to be at a minimum sort of level. There's like a bottom level that you need to be able to comply with. And, and, and those get crossed over sometimes where the regulatory side um, can, can push towards things that are aspirational and it can deflate the, the efforts, um, if if that if that regulation is too constraining, um, the other the other downside of regulation, um, from my perspective, is there's just no one body across the globe that can regulate everybody, and so and so if if the U.S. has very strict regulation on on brightness, then companies are going to go to other other countries to to file for their systems and so there's ways to gain the regulation by by moving things around and um and so you know for, for us that balance is you know our our preference is um is that is that there are there's accountability for for doing the right thing without having it be punitive with regulation so and i, I know patricia probably has thoughts on this as well yeah, I think regulators are balancing um, uh, space um, objectives for their country. Uh, they want to have uh, services. They want to have space-based activity. They want to have a space economy. They want to have space jobs. They, you know, there's a whole bunch of different objectives that go into a government's uh, uh, trades 
on, on space. And one of them is the value of discovery in science. Um, I think my personal opinion as someone who spent almost my whole career in space regulation is that we aren't far enough along to actually regulate this because there's not a clear path to um, compliance. If I'm a new satellite operator, uh, I don't think the astronomy community can say that you're comfortable that there is a, an action they can undertake that will absolutely make them comply with the seventh magnitude. We're just not that far not along. Now, and, um, and until we are, uh, I think what Goldie was mentioning is accountability is a, is a great um, early step to say that the regulators should be checking in with their licensees to see if they're considering this, if they're taking it on board, what their solutions are. And that I think is, uh, is an early step. Companies like SpaceX aren't the ones that worry about regulation. They're at the forefront of these uh, revelations. It's the companies that aren't thinking about it or um, are trying to cut corners uh, uh, to, to make their 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 uh, um, business plan close. And they don't want to invest in it um, or just unavailable. Don't know how to find out whether my satellite's going to be bright because there's not enough tools and resources. Thanks. And in fact, we've got a quite an interesting question that's come out at the last minute. We thought we've got enough time to cover it mm -hmm. from Mabel Angelo online. Uh, and I think this is, she says it's for, for, for Goldie, but I think actually it's probably for Patric Patricia. <laughs> uh, why don't companies create a multinational and then divide up a single constellation so as not to multiply as happens with the telephone companies? Well, that's not what happens with telephone companies, as a matter of fact. Well, I think um, the history of Bell, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was a long time ago. Right now, the the idea is that uh, uh, there's there's not monopolies. They're not uh, that there's innovation and improvements that come from um, private investment and uh, and competition, and that is the kind of prevailing uh, economic and uh, and business philosophy for most countries. Um, there are governments who are planning to build constellations. Uh, the European Union for one, uh, China for another, um, where they're going to use governments to to build constellations. Uh, but those will not be for, uh, from what I understand, they're not meant to be for the same purposes of like consumer con uh, uh, connections. Um, and, and we had that in the satellite world early on. Uh, you know, Intelsat and Inmarsat were both treaty-based organizations where governments collaboratively concluded satellites were too expensive and to uh, risky, and they all paid in to a common uh, pool and invested, but it, it, it wasn't needed at the end. There were private companies who felt they could do it faster, cheaper, uh, more innovatively. So um, that, that model's been used in the space world. It's been used in the telecom world. It's not where we are right now. Um, and and for I, I think if you look at the advancement in um, utility and value from space-based platforms, and the excitement surrounding um, space development, um, that's probably the strongest rationale why. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I'm uh, being an engineer, uh, probably not the best person to comment on, on that, but it, it did spark something that, that, I, that I would ask um, that, that y'all think about how, how, can, how can we influence China here? Um, you know, on, on with respect to to brightness mitigation and and uh, radio astronomy, because you know we're 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 working as best we can on the space safety side to interact with them, and it's it's quite difficult. But on the astronomy side, you know, my hope would be that there could be some influence on those on the companies that are building their large constellations to um, to factor in brightness from during their design. As opposed to it being an afterthought, and then, uh, and 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 then, then the dark and quiet skies are going to be, you know, negatively impacted in a way that um, there, there's no influence on. So I, I would, I would, you know, I would suggest that that mm -hmm. um, we all figure out what strategy to to influence them. Yeah, thank and you. I would just add one other thing, Tim. You had asked early on what are some of the mitigating factors to. Um, the proliferation of LEO uh, satellites. And I think one thing we're going to see is as um, uh, satellite constellation networks get stabilized, um, I think we'll start seeing what's, what are called hosted payloads. So a new function, a new, um, a new uh, uh, kind of capability 
will hang off of that same uh, spacecraft. So instead of having it uh, just be for broadband, maybe you'd add a camera to it or you'd add some other uh, star trackers to give some uh, situational awareness around it. So you'd, you'd, you could use the same constellation space-based platform for multiple purposes and, and ultimately potentially multiple um, uh, most multiple customers. Yeah, so that may one. mean that not everyone needs their own constellation if you have some kind of condominium satellites. Yeah. Uh, and Iris I think that's too. that's think starting that's... to be that's starting to emerge a little. Iris squared is is pretty much along those lines. I think mm -hmm. we'll take one more from the floor. Yeah. Thank you very much. And then we'll wrap up. Is this working? Uh, if yes. there are any other questions, please put them online and they will get answered through the INT Hub. All right, so I am David Galadi from the Spanish Astronomical Society, and I first have a very short comment for David from SpaceX, because I especially liked your suggestion of being transparent, because we all thought that it would be really very nice if you could make your satellites transparent. <laughs> but well, I know yeah. it's a joke only, I know that this was not the meaning of your comment. I have a, a true question. I have a question about uh, engineering. No. I would ask you to explain to the audience what the Carrington-like event is and how you have prepared your satellites to resist it. I'm sorry, can you can you repeat Carrington. the question? Carrington. C-A-R-R-I-N-T-O-N, Carrington. The fact that you don't know the word already is an answer. No, no, I do know, I do know the word. I couldn't understand what you said, I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, my, my understanding. Um, the answer. Yeah, put it in yeah. Slack. That may be the idea. Okay, I think we'll wrap up now. Thank okay. you very much for your attention, but please put your hands together for my two experts here, Goldie and Patricia. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. And we obviously, need to, we need the story everyone. continues. That we, we need to be able to have uh, have you turn on the microphones for the audience so we can hear the applause because we just... We heard, it didn't sound like anyone. <laughs> <Yeah, applied>. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Thank so you. Much. So the story continues. The INT Hub, one of the functions of the INT Hub is to conduct such fora as this, bringing more industry in to answer more questions. Here, if we had more industry, we'd have an N squared problem. Here, we're, I think we've had good representation and good coverage. But as I say, any other questions that have occurred to you, please put them in Slack and we'll put them through the INT Hub for answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.